This is a not quite one minute guide to mountain building. It's intended to be a conceptual framework to help people understand how Scotland's mountains fit into the general orogenesis and mountain building um, framework. So I'm sure we've seen images like this before. It's a cartoon of a subduction zone. The green is the mantle, which is silicate. The dark blue is the ocean lithosphere, which is also a silicate rock. And then we have in the pink colors, a continental crust, which is another silicate rock. This is the ocean, the light blue on the top. So the ocean crust is uh, the ocean lithosphere is denser than the mantle and it sinks into the mantle. And that's what is driving subduction. So the pull, the weight of the ocean crust is dragging the ocean crust along this way and dragging it into the mantle. And that's what's producing convergence uh, at the ocean continent uh, boundary. Okay, and thickening of the continental crust here. Okay, so the first thing that we see is this region that I put in grey here. And this is where sediments are being scraped off the subducting ocean crust. And we get what's called an accretionary prism. So these are deep sea sediments uh, and they will be metamorphosed into slates and you get a lot of thrusting, thrust faulting there and they stack up and repeated units of the same age material all the same way up. And that's called an accretionary prism and it's what we see in the southern uplands. Okay. If we let subduction continue a little bit further we get uh, crustal, continental crustal thickening and folding and we have a large significant uh, fault zone between the subducting ocean crust and the overriding continental plate. Okay. That's perhaps a good model for what we see in the Outer Hebrides, the Outer Hebrides fault zone and the Moyne thrust. Here's another bit of continental crust that's being dragged along by the subducting slab and eventually these two continents are going to uh, collide and we're going to end up with continent-continent collision. Okay. Before that happens, we get melting in the mantle as the subducting slab dehydrates and releases water. And that produces basalt. And that basalt can't go through the continental crust because it's denser than the continental crust. So it sits at the bottom of the continental crust and melts it and mixes with it, producing a, an andesitic composition of melt that can go through the crust. And it's what we see currently in the Andes. So this part of the image is essentially what we see in the Andes. That's not well represented in Scotland because you know, all the top of the Scottish mountains have been eroded away, so we don't see this um, Andes-style um, mountain development in Scotland. At a later stage, once this uh, subducting downgoing plate uh, drags the continental crust along and we get continent continent collision. This is what we're seeing in the Himalayas at the moment. Um, convergence between the two continents is still being driven by the fact that there's oceanic crust down here which is dense in the mantle which is pulling the continental crust down. This yellow continental crust is less dense than the mantle so it's wanting to come back up again but at the moment it's still being dragged down by the ocean slab which is attached to it. And you get extreme crustal thickening. This produces naps, large bodies of folded over and tipped onto their sides, um, things. And I've discussed those in one minute naps. We see them in the Mamors and Glenfinnan and the Road to the Isles, really nicely developed. Okay. The other thing that happens is you end up with extreme heating at the base of the continental crust. It gets to over 700 or 800 degrees C. And at that stage, uh, continental crust starts to melt and it produces granitic composition melts. If you have metamorphic rock, which is partially molten, it's called a migmatite. And Loch Shiel has beautifully developed migmatites. And Ardgar actually has large granitic bodies, which are thought to be segregations from the Loch Shiel type migmatites. These granites currently at this stage can't 
ascend through the continental crust, although they're slightly less dense because everything is being pushed together. They can't actually break their way through and produce tensile fractures to rise up. So they're kind of trapped in the base of the continental crust. So at this stage, we have a collision. Um, in Scotland, we had convergence. This is the Moyne thrust. The Outer Hebrides thrust runs along here, and we see that the thrust zones, the faults, main faults, are essentially at right angles to the direction of compression. And on the right side, this is the uh, Barovian metamorphic zones, and essentially they're following or mapping out the major folding in the Scottish sediments. And you can see that the fold axes again run parallel to the Moyne thrust. There's the Moyne thrust there. The fold axes are parallel to it, perpendicular to the compression direction. Okay, so this is typical for convergence. Okay, so by looking at the fold axis, you can work out the direction of convergence. Eventually, the ocean crust is going to break off, at which point this becomes dynamically unstable. We have deeply buried continental crust, and deep down to over 100 kilometers depth into the mantle. So this is dynamically unstable, and it will start to rebound and come back up. And that actually puts the overriding plate into tension. So now you get gravitational collapse of the mountain belt. That opens up fractures, and it allows magmas to rise through. So this is a late stage of what happens when you stop pushing on the mountains, and it can all be allowed to just re-equilibrate with gravity. Okay. So things like the Cairngorm granite and Craig Dew and the granites in Cornwall, they're all relatively late stage in place. The melts would have been generated during the extreme crustal thickening, but they can't be emplaced into the shallower crust until you start to get this gravitational collapse stage. And if they get to the very surface, then you get things like Glencoe and Ben Nevis, these very large caldera eruptions major volcanic events, extremely violent, extremely silica-rich magmas, which trap gas and produce these really violent eruptions. And if we look on a map in terms of the orientation of the intrusions, the blue lines here are all late-stage dikes that cut through Glencoe. Okay? And you can see that once again they're running approximately parallel to the Moyne thrust, and this is now the direction, these blue arrows are the direction of gravitational collapse, of stretching of the mountain belt, and you can see that once again these open fractures, which are what dikes are, open fractures filled with magma, are consistent with the direction of stretching. So that's a very brief history of Scottish mountain building. In the Alps we see all of these stages as well. So the Ivrea complex is actually a little bit of a mantle which has been trapped as this underriding continental plate rebounded. It dragged up some mantle, producing the Ivrea complex. Dora Mara is very deep continental crust. We got down to about 120 kilometers depth. It has extreme high pressure minerals in it. Monte Rosa is not quite so high pressure, probably got to about 70 or 80 kilometers depth. Mont Blanc is granitic and it's on in the overwriting plate and it's part of these late stage granite emplacements. And then somewhere like the Jura or the Dolomites that is quite shallow upper crustal, it's been deformed but in a semi-brittle manner and hasn't been very highly uh, metamorphosed. So there we are, a history of mountain building for Scotland and for the Alps.